Hello, welcome to Aging Well. My name is Nathan Lamb, I'm your host. And with me today is my fabulous guest, Jeannie Leiden. Thank you, Nathan. Welcome to the show. So Jeannie is going here today to talk with us about our adult family care program at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. And it's a really great program and we're um, pretty excited to dive right in and talk about it. So. Okay, thank, well thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. Um, yes, the Adult Family Care Program, we work out of some of the Cambridge Elder Services. So the Adult Family Care Program, if you hear the name, it also means adult foster care. And really it's a mass health funded program that serves um, clients ages 16 and up. I think our youngest client in this program is 18 right now and our oldest might be 104. So we have a wide range of ages, a wide range of um, medical diagnoses, uh, mental health diagnoses. Um, in this program. So it's a program where a participant wants to stay at home, wants to be, you know, least restrictive environment, and they need help with activities of daily living, like bathing and dressing. Mm. And they need help, and we have a caregiver who prize, provides help in a home setting. So we have probably, um, in our program, we have about 260 families right now. Mm. And a majority, I'd say three quarters of our um, families are people that know each other, like a, a family, a mother taking care of a child, a child taking care of a parent. It may be a sibling or a friend. They kind of know each other. And they get the support of a nurse and a social worker in the home setting, mm -hmm. and they get a tax-free stipend for, for taking care of um, their loved one. The only thing with, you cannot be a caregiver if you're um, a spouse of a person or a legal guardian. But we also have cases where we need to find home for pieces, people that don't have family. So we have a home matching process where um, we have qualified caregivers who will take a person into their home. Absolutely. So it really helps people who are providing care um, in a home setting. It really helps them make it work in a, in a variety of different ways. Yes, what's, what's really nice with this program is that a caregiver, it's a 24-7 job, and um, the caregiver has the support of a social worker and a nurse, and um, our social workers and nurses, they, they're a team, they go out every single month, and they work with both the participant and the caregiver, and there's a lot that we do with caregiver stress, there's a lot that we do with teaching about medications, um, medical diagnoses, anything that comes along. So. It's a support for family, and you know, to really validate, um, it's not always easy being a caregiver. Absolutely, and the requirements are basically uh, must be Mass Health eligible, and they must uh, the person receiving care um, must require daily help. Yes, the Mass Health. Um, eligible, the person needs to require care with activities of daily living. And we have two different levels in this group. Um, and our client, the need a level one client would be a person that needs cues and supervision for one activity of daily living. And that's ADLs. And for, for you know, a lot of the lay person, what is an ADL? Mm -hmm. Activities of daily living. So bathing, dressing, ambulating, eating. So, uh, you know, we get a referral, some, someone calls in, does this person really need help? They can't bathe on their own, they don't dress on their own, they need help ambulating. So cues and supervision would be our level one participant. An example of our level one participant is we have many younger um, clients with developmental disabilities. We have um, some with um, traumatic brain injury, um, some with um, mental health diagnoses. A lot, that's a lot of our younger clients. Then we have the level two client, which is um, a much needier client, and that's a person that needs physical hands on hand, hands on hands assist with two or more activities of daily living. So physical help to bathe, to dress, to eat, to ambulate, to transfer. So the physical help. Mm. And so there's definitely a lot of different scenarios where you guys can help people uh, make it work. There, there are so many different scenarios. We have, um, happy to say that we've had some real success stories taking people out of nursing homes mm. that have advocated for themselves. We had an individual um, that spoke only Spanish and she was in a nursing facility where no one did. Mm. And we were able to match her with a caregiver. 
um, who spoke Spanish and um, and the caregiver had a background in nursing mm. and she's out of the nursing home really really happy living in you know not a restrictive environment in a loving caring home that they speak the same language so oh, that's great yeah and for the live-in caregivers the requirements one of them is they must live with the person receiving care uh, what are some of the other things that you're looking for when you get an application for living? Yes, we do a um, really thorough screening of a caregiver, whether it's a family member or we're matching a, a person in a family. Same screening process goes out. So first we want to make sure that this person is a loving, caring individual and they're going to provide a safe, loving home for this individual. That's the number one priority. So our whole screening process is... We go out and we do a whole assessment, a psychosocial assessment, um, with both the participant and the caregiver, but the caregiver asking specific questions and, um, you know, what their background is, is likes and dislikes, um, have they had any issues with different things, and we do a criminal background check, a Medicaid check on people, we do criminal background checks on anyone else living in the home, we ask for personal, professional references, we get a doctor to to sign off that yes, this caregiver is appropriate to provide care. And then our nurse and social worker meet them and talk to each other and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So after all that is done, we will say, yes, this is an appropriate caregiver, or no, it isn't. In mm -hmm. most cases, it is, except if a criminal background check mm -hmm. came back. So that's, that's part of it, qualifying the caregiver. We also have to qualify in the home setting that it meets mass health um, criteria, you know, like fire extinguishers, first aid kits, um, safe landing going in, and things like that. And generally, how long does that screening application process take? We have, our hope is that when we get a referral, that we respond to a referral within two days, mm -hmm. and that our nurse and social worker is out to do an assessment and evaluation within 10 days. Mm -hmm. And our hope, our, our hope for a good turnaround time would be 45 days mm -hmm. um, from time of referral to placement. And the things that, you know, would hold this up is if we, we need a sign off from either a nurse practitioner or a primary care physician, that this person is eligible for the program, they, they need to sign off on that. Um, and TB screening and the different things we may, that could hold us up if we don't get it. But we've um, gotten pretty good at, at getting physicals and things like that back mm -hmm. in a timely manner. Now, one more thing before we go to break. Yeah. I know in the past we've spoken about this and uh, so it's not really a surprise, but in the past, I've heard you say that you love this program. Can you tell me I a little bit about that? I love this program. Like, I became a nurse really late in life, and I graduated at 40, and I changed, you know, I, I, I did two, every two years I would change my job just to get the different experiences. And this job, adult family care, is everything I could ever hope for. Um, you know, I'm the director of the program, but I'm also the nurse, so I give clinical oversight uh, to our clinicians. Um, but we get to be with families, we get to work with clients in need, and, you know, um, working, uh, I was a um, psychiatric nurse for uh, many years, and we see a lot of um, our clients have some, some kind of mental health diagnosis, and it, it's great feeling to know that we can provide support in the home setting to these clients. Um, I love working with the team of nurses and social workers that we have. It's, and the families just, we get so close to them. We get to know these families because we're out there every single month. So it, it's just, it, it's a dream job to me, truly. I, I love and believe in this program. I've been doing it for 16 years. Oh, that's really great. I think that's it for our first segment. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Aging Well. I'm your host, Nathan Lamb. Today our topic is our adult family care program at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. With me today is Jeannie Lydon. Good to see you. Great to have you in the studio. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about National Caregiver Month in this segment. Uh, National Caregiver Month is in November. The theme for this year is Take Care to Give Care, 
And this really touches on a theme that's close to your heart, uh, supporting the caregivers and, and helping them to succeed. So can you tell me a little bit about what AFC is doing for that? Uh, yes. Um, well, we, we try to validate what our caregivers do any chance we can because it's a 24-7 around-the-clock job. And sometimes you don't always get a lot of, uh, well, thank you so much for what you do. So we really try to validate what, what, the, you know, what they do on a uh, regular basis. Um, but we also, our agency is so great, some of our Cambridge Elder Services, that we take a portion of what we make from this program and we give it back into the program. So it's very important that we do things for our caregivers, and especially on, uh, you know, November when it's National Caregiver Month. Last year, we um, had first aid kits made up for all our families, you know, and now when a new client comes on to our program, they start them out with a first aid kit. So it's a win-win. We need this to be in compliance with Mass Health, but it was a great thing. Our caregivers loved, loved it. This year, we are giving tote bags with AFC, and we're going to have a lot of different things in the tote bags. Um, you know, 10 of the best ways to deal with caregiver stress. Mm -hmm. Some fun tips. We're going to have some fun stress balls. Um, some educational resources where there are support groups and different things like that. So we're going to go um, out with our tote bags for each one of them. And we also, um, in this program, we're required to, to do um, clinical teaching and training throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So we pretty much every month go out and we have a, an agenda or a, a training topic. and. Um, we try to stick to it, but sometimes you may go out to the home and the caregiver just might be having a stressful day or the participant, and you may switch gears to just provide emotional support. We do a lot of that. So our caregivers really, they, they when we gave them the first aid kits last night, last year, and we also sent out a letter just thanking them for all you know that they do and that we really appreciate them and how it much, much it means to all of us as the AFC team to be part of their lives. It's really great. Yeah. And you, you touched on it there, the ongoing. It's nice to have a big recognition once per year, but the, the ongoing supports, the way that you're able to help combat caregiver stress um, through both the respite and the tr um, training. Can we talk a little bit about the respite? Yes, yeah, so what um, our, our caregivers can have two weeks off in the course of the year to take time off for themselves. Um, we encourage this wholeheartedly, as much as you love somebody, you know, um, to have a little separation, but you deserve to have a vacation. What we find a lot of times, um, that caregivers tend to not take good enough care of themselves. And really, if you want to be in this for the long haul, you have to. Mm. So that's the kind of thing, um, really trying to um, show and teach a caregiver healthy choices, healthy lifestyles, taking that two weeks off, to go do something to have that time for yourself. And so they will still get paid their, their you know, um, stipend for that, that period for two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. And we also pay another caregiver that at a little higher rate to come in and provide care for their participant during that time. That's great. Yeah, so. I, I think the way it was phrased in the um, promotional materials for the um, caregiver month was they said that caregivers often put themselves last because they're busy caring for others. They so often do. And even sometimes in this program, we've had um, some families like that their first reaction is, no, I cannot accept payment for taking care of my mother. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. And then you see the sacrifices that, that people make taking care of somebody. You know, I've seen families give up a job, you know, um, give up jobs and that financial security of their own job to just be providing care. So to get through that barrier, this is a Mass Health funded program that is there for somebody who meets that Mass Health criteria, you're eligible for it. And sometimes, you know, when you break through this resistance, they're really appreciative of the support that they have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I'll just bring up, because we were talking about it recently. Uh, there was a study that some of the folks in your department brought to my attention where they it wasn't quite entirely apples to apples, but it was a study out in California with intensive caregiver training. And they basically found that um, there were correlations between better health and increased training for caregivers, which I, I thought was kind of great because it's an ongoing uh, effort that AFC has to train caregivers. And then there's this study that 
this was slightly different, slightly more intensive. This was like 40 hours. But it was a lot of the same topics they were training the people on. Right. And they were having better outcomes with maintaining health. I think avoiding trips to the emergency room was one of them. So it, it does seem like that training can also help make a difference and help them provide that better care. The training really does, does help. Um, with some of our, uh, say a client with um, a mental health diagnosis, we have many clients with dual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. They may have something like bipolar or Asperger's. And um, we could really correlate a decrease in psych hospitalization since they were in our program. We've had, um, you know, I can think of a young man that was in our program for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a caregiver who had raised um, three boys. His wife had, had passed away and he wanted to do something um, meaningful in his life. Never even knew what Asperger's was, but we did a lot of training and teaching. He joined an Asperger's support group with this client. Mm -hmm. And um, that client, I think through the 10 years, it was um, one, hos one psych hospitalization. Mm -hmm. So it really, really works when you're, you're able to have a good caregiver providing support in a loving environment and also the support of a, a nurse and social worker. And mm -hmm. we've seen fall risks. A lot of times there's a decrease in falls because of being in a, you know, um, a, a structured program where you have oversight. Absolutely. That, that jogged my memory. I remember in discussing the training, Part of it was fairly standardized, and then my understanding was that some of it is a little more uh, tailored to the household's needs, as you were indicating with, uh, in that one example that you gave. So it's kind of a mix. It absolutely is. So if someone comes along and they, they have a new diagnosis, they're diabetic, we're going to have to switch gears. If we were going out with one topic and this is a new diagnosis, we're going to get out there and do a lot of teaching around diabetes, what it is, both for the participant and the caregiver, and oversee that kind of thing. So a lot of teaching, education, and support. Absolutely. All right. Well, I guess we'll uh, take a quick break. We'll be back for a third and final segment. And welcome back to Aging Well. I'm your host, Nathan Lamb. With me today is my guest, Jeannie Lydon. Hi. Thanks again for being here today. This is great. We're learning so much about the adult family care program. Um, and at this point, I was hoping we could sort of circle back and take a closer look at one of the really important aspects of the program. And that would be the role that the nurses and the social workers play in, in making it work and how they're both uh, crucial to to making it work. Uh, can you tell me a little bit Certainly. more about that? It's um, In AFC, it's really, really uh, collaborative, and we're really, really a team, nurse and social workers, working closely. Either, even though we're two different disciplines, we do a lot of the same thing, and we reinforce a lot of the same um, things. The biggest thing, OK, for our, for our nurses, they our nurses are, of course, medical. You know, mm -hmm. They're going to be doing a lot of teaching about uh, medications, uh, they, do they, do the client and does the caregiver understand the medications? Are they being taken properly? Um, any new medication that comes along, teaching, or any new diagnosis that comes along, um, there's going to be teaching about that and oversight to make sure that both the caregiver and the participant, mm -hmm. if they're able, understands what's going on. So, but both nursing and social worker, we do so much with caregiver stress. Mm -hmm. Really coming in, I think a lot of times the caregiver looks forward to the visit, you know. Mm -hmm. They can vent, they can talk about what's going well, talk about what's not going so well. Mm -hmm. So that just um, talking back and forth and, and giving emotional support is just such a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, our social workers do a lot of the psychosocial stuff for both the caregiver and the participant. Um, they assist with things like advanced directives, healthcare proxies. When you know um, someone needs an adult day health program, we need to know the community resources because we travel a lot of different, um, you know, cities, and our nurses and social worker have to know resources in all different places. And mm -hmm. many of our participants do go to adult day health programs, so um, we want to be able to know where we can recommend that, and we mm -hmm. encourage if 
it's nice that you know we have um, some clients with dementia and they may go out to an adult day health program uh, for dementia. It gives the uh, caregiver a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. So the psychosocial piece, emotional support comes from both nurse and social worker, healthcare proxies, finding adult day health programs. Mm -hmm. And if it ever comes to the point where it's too hard for somebody, that they no longer, you know, the home setting is not appropriate, then we would switch gears and we would have the resources to assist the family Mm -hmm. and going in a different direction. Absolutely. And I think something you alluded to earlier is that there's a, um, a basically a, a, a health plan that, that incorporates those two viewpoints that they come up with for each client who comes into AFC. So there's really a comprehensive look at the, the needs and it, and it has those two viewpoints integrated into it. Absolutely. We do uh, um, individual um, health care plan whenever anyone comes in the program within 30 days mm -hmm. of them starting. And it's really the nurse has a piece in it, the social worker. We list what the caregiver is and, and the participant, what, who's going to do what. And a lot of times it's all of us doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So there might be a psychosocial piece in a care plan. There might be a self-care deficit you know, related to what the medical diagnoses are and all the kinds of things that, that's going to go on. The caregiver is going to provide supervision, oversight, or physical hands-on hands on assist when bathing and showering, so all those kinds of things. And if they need, you know, direction, we're going to give them that, that direction because they also fill out a caregiver log, our, our, our caregivers, a daily log saying they do A, B, C, D for this client. Mm. So... Um, that answers your question. And one thing I will add that you're jogging my memory on, the uh, clients do really seem to appreciate it because we recently had our uh, customer satisfaction surveys. Um, I think it was over 96% positive. Yes, it was. That, you know, that makes you proud as the director of the program when you see that. Mm -hmm. And it's been consistent over the past several years that um, very positive, um, you know, feedback. And, um, and again, it attests to um, uh, just such a great team of nurses and social workers that um, they really bond with these families and they, they treat them with such care and respect. Mm. And um, these families and clients, they know that they can count on them for support. So That's really great. And switching gears a little bit, um, the uh, topic of qualified caregivers, it's my understanding that AFC might be on the lookout for people who could be qualified caregivers. Can you tell me a little bit more? Yes, we absolutely are. In, in most cases, like we say, people are already living in the same home, a caregiver may be a daughter or a son or something, and they live in the home. And with AFC, the person has to live together. Mm -hmm. But we have, I even had a call just today, mm -hmm. um, a person that um, is looking for a person who's living on their own right now and um, has dementia and things are getting tougher for this person to be safe at home. So they're, they're looking into AFC. So um, it's tough because we have a list of about eight qualified caregivers in different areas. Um, I think Revere, we have Malden, you know, um, Dorchester, Hyde Park. So we have this qualified list of caregivers, but do we have a qualified caregiver right now in an area of where this family is looking um, we don't. So what we had recommended to, to this um, caregiver, she's very religious from just talking on the phone, mm -hmm. I had asked her if she um, belongs to any special church, and um, because she'd like to keep her loved one in the area that they're in. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to go to her church this week and talk to her pastor and talk to um, the community members and really put a plea out there. Mm -hmm. You know, my sister has early onset dementia, I'm looking for somebody who would be willing to take her into their home, love her, care for her, mm -hmm. and they'll get a tax-free stipend for doing this. So we look any way we can get a caregiver. We have clients that need caregivers and handicapped accessible homes. That's our biggest. We fill these homes so quickly. And, you know, a caregiver, we have many caregivers that qualified in mental health, mm -hmm. not near enough, you know. And um, we don't want to turn away someone because they have a mental health diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we're always looking for qualified caregivers that may be willing 
to take someone in their home with a mental health diagnosis, either be willing to learn about it or already have some background experience. So there's people who the program would like to help, but you need the caregivers to actually, you need that, that part of the match. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes we'll have a someone looking for a home and they live in Somerville on, you know, uh, Morland Street and they're only willing to go as far as uh, Broadway, the mm -hmm. next street over. Mm -hmm. It's not like that, you know, we're lucky if we could get this next town. Yeah. And, and fortunately right now we do have kind of um, several right around this area. Um, so, so that's a tough one, but we're always looking. And, mm -hmm. you know, even if anyone is watching this show and they're taking care of a loved one, just ask themselves, you know, um, is their loved one on mass health? Are they providing cues and supervision or physical hands-on hands assist with bathing, dressing, mm -hmm. ambulating, eating, or transferring mm -hmm. that they could be eligible for this program? Absolutely. It's yeah. My uh, one of my aunts is in that um, exact same situation where she's caring for uh, my grandparents, and it's the sort of thing I, I thought of that when I first learned of this program was that it could really help a situation like that work. Um, really so, does. So I've definitely seen it in practice. And one thing I want to mention is that the service area for AFC with Somerville Cambridge Elder Services, but we actually do serve a much wider area. We have a wide catch area, and I think that's going to be shown a, a little later, but we have, you know, probably about 30, 40 families right locally here. Mm -hmm. We travel as far as Georgetown up north, where, where Sudbury, you name it, we will go somewhere, especially, you know, when we have a participant who needs a home mm -hmm. and is a qualified caregiver, that's why we have this wide catch area where we're willing to go to these places. Mm -hmm. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Just it was a pleasure, just that if anyone's watching this program and they have any questions whatsoever, to call us. That this is um, where we love talking about the program. It's a program we believe in. It's a program that continues to grow. And our goal is to help people stay in uh, the least restrictive en environment as long as they can with supports in place. So feel free. I'm available, you know, 617-628-2601, ex extension 3072. Jeannie Lyden, the director. And I love talking about this program. So any kind of question, feel free to call. It's been my experience. You are passionate about AFC, and it's been a pleasure to have you in the studio well, thanks, today. Nathan. Thank you, Jean. My pleasure, too. So that's all the time we have for Aging Well this month. Um, we'll be back soon. Uh, thanks again for watching.